afternoon, everybody. I always start a little bit late with asking students because I know once you get a degree, you forget to tell the time. So everyone comes late. That's okay. Um, so, I know Reese isn't around at the moment because he's not well. Well, I was supposed to do this lecture anyway, so this isn't any different for any other year. I would always schedule to do this lecture. And the reason for that is that this is one of the areas that I do my research on. My name is Dr. Linton Evans. I'm a associate professor in media theory in the Department of Media Communication. And my research interests are in what's known as immersive media. So I research video games and for the past five years in particular virtual reality video games. So I've written several papers and two books on the subject of virtual reality, which I've provided to everyone on Canvas. If you have a look for under this week, you have a copy of both of those books. So if you do wish to do something on virtual reality for this module, Basically, this lecture today is taken out of one of those books, so um, you have a copy of that. Um, and you have my more recent book as well, which is about the metaverse, which the end of this lecture will cover in some detail. So before we go any further, let's have an assessment so I know, I can make a judgment whether people know what the hell I'm talking about before we start. By a show of hands, please, how many of you have tried virtual reality? Not many. Are you on the VR course? Do you know why I knew that? What is that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely do it because of that. Um, okay, so not many of you. So who can tell me what virtual reality is then? Let me start with a more basic question. Who gives a fuck what virtual reality is? Is there anyone in this room who cares? Sure? Okay. Yeah. Okay, we're getting somewhere. Good. We'll start with easy questions and we go along from there. Okay, so some, there's some interest in what this might be. So, can anyone tell me what it is? Different space. Well, let's go with that. Different space. What do you mean? Different from what? Uh, analog world, so it's the visuals. Analog world, that's an interesting way of calling our everyday existence. Yeah, but uh, yeah, because of course many theorists, as you know from this course, right, many theorists will argue that we live in a digitally augmented world now. But, so let's maybe drop the word out. Normal existence, this stuff that's going on here right now, this isn't, this isn't digitally generated, right? This is real stuff around us. Me, I'm made of water and carbon and all sorts of other crap right that goes together. We're all made of stuff. But virtual reality is not made of the same stuff. Virtual reality is a digitally generated world. A digitally generated world which nevertheless we can exist in. As the properties by which we can have spatial existence, so we have a body which is real, but we nevertheless have a physical presence in that space. And a space which we can move around, we can interact with others, we can do things, we can pick digital things up and put them down. So there are objects in that space. And if you like, it is an attempt to escape this stuff. Why do we want to why do we want to escape? Why does anyone want to escape this beautiful world around? Not every part of it is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Entertainment. Say so, yeah. Entertainment. Entertainment. Yeah. More. Not every part of it is beautiful. Like to escape conflict. Escape conflict. How about escaping other people? Don't we? We don't like being around other people, right? You've all been to the supermarket. Yeah. It sucks. Other people suck. You've been to that shop down there in Fulton House, right? They stink. I have to go in that shop, I have to buy milk, I have to buy cola for lectures because I have an attention deficit problem, so I need caffeine all the time, right? I have to go in the shop to do it. 
Everyone in that place stinks. And they all get in your way. And they cause you frustration. They're stupid. And they're ugly. People are bad. So we can get away from people. We can get away from the world. We can get away from people who want to kill us. We can want to get away from people who want to rip us off. We can get away from conflicts. We can get away from arguments. We can get away from traffic. We can get away from pollution. We can get away from war. We can get away from conflict. We can take a world and make it perfect away from all the imperfections of the world in which we exist in. This one, friends, is called techno-utopianism. And virtual reality is a classic example of what is known as techno-utopianism. The idea that you can apply technology in a particular way and it will create something better than currently exists. Technology will solve the problems that we have. So if our world is imperfect, it's full of all these sucky things, you know, I can ride on my trainers when I walk to work. Well, how about creating a place where there is no mud? Okay. I get deeply frustrated by people getting in front of me in the shop down there when I'm trying to buy my bottle of cola. How about creating a place where there are no people in front of me? I just get my Pretty sweet, right? Utopian projects in general are a feature of human existence. Human beings are deeply, deeply invested in utopian projects and always have been. Most states and nation states were founded on utopian principles. We're going to make a perfect thing. The history of Western civilization, and indeed global civilization, is usually a history of. These guys rule us at the moment, right? We're going to kick these guys out and make something better. That's how nation states evolve. Don't usually work. Funnily enough, as we'll discover in this lecture, this don't work either. Utopian projects are usually doomed to failure because life itself is messy. Life itself is chaotic. Life itself is horrible. Life sucks. But we have to do it because the choice otherwise is annihilation. That's not really a choice at all. Anyway, that's a very deep philosophical discussion of where virtual reality comes from. What I want to do in this lecture is give you some more context to those points. So, introduce you to the history and the historical, historical trajectory of virtual reality as a medium. Introduce you to the promise of VR. Why? People thought virtual reality was a good idea and what it could offer us. Why it's important in contemporary culture. How social interaction being implemented through it, because this is the big one. There's no point in existing in VR if there's no other people. So how is social interaction being programmed into it? And what is the metaverse? What are the implications of the metaverse? Special hands of anyone here with that word before metaverse. And a couple. Okay. Um, I guess the rest of you will hear a bit by the end of the day, which is kind of my job, right? Oh, I hate these machines so much. I hate this university so much. Oh, I should get a better job. Never mind. Come here. <laughs> I'm going to do okay today, right? I'm going to do good for you guys. Then maybe I'll go back to my office and have a look for a better job. <laughs> okay, so virtual reality has been around for a very long time. Virtual reality as a term has been around for nearly a hundred years. In 1938, Antonin Apol, the English translation is in 1958, so I'll give that in brackets afterwards, right? First came up with the term virtual reality, the first use of it. When he explained the illusory nature of characters and objects in the theatre as la réalité virtuelle. French, right? um, the idea of creating an alternative reality through media has really been around since the 19th century, and the first forerunners of that were technologies like magic lanterns and the panorama, uh, which emerged at the start of the 19th century. 
So the idea of being able to create an alternative plane of existence through media has been around for a very long time. What these technologies lacked was digital. These were, as the word you used earlier, analog versions of this, which meant they were really, really limited in what you could do. You could create a visual illusion, for example, that something existed when it didn't actually exist, but this was limited by the kind of technology that you could use. The good thing about the digital and anything digital is it never runs out. It never gets tired, it never gets bored, it never has to stop to have some food or to have something to drink. A digital machine keeps on going forever and ever and ever. It keeps on processing, it keeps on working. So, all the circuitry in it does. It's a bit different to winding something for ages like this. And you think, oh my god, my arm's getting tired. Have you had enough of this illusion yet? Why don't you stop doing this? I'm getting really tired. The digital machine doesn't do this. In terms of the theatre, in the 1930s in France, there was experimentalism in the theatre. They were looking to create visual illusions of people to immerse them more deeply in the theatrical experience. Hence, it was called la réalité virtuelle, a reality which is virtual, that does not exist physically. So, we've been talking or using the term virtual reality for a very, very long time. But the first virtual reality machine did not exist. Do you know what occurs to me? I should have brought some reality machines, right? I've got like eight of them in my office. I oh, know. That sucks. How many good guys are deep, right? If you want to come and try virtual reality, I have a lab down in the James Callahan building, and when it's up and running in a couple of weeks' time, I'll put an email out to everyone in this class inviting you to come and try it. Right? Thank you. There you, go. you guys are doing it. You <laughs> 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 So, the first instance of a virtual reality machine, the reason why I bring up, like, should have brought them with me, is a VR machine is very, very straightforward, right? You have a big set of goggles on. And through that set of goggles, you have a um, set of lenses in there, which project a digitally created image at your eyes, tricking you into thinking that thing is your field of vision, right? Okay. So, that kind of sensory input device has existed since the early 1960s, so we're talking 60 years ago. The first instance of it was by Morton Halig, and it's called the Sensorama. What you can see here is a computer terminal, okay, with a display as you would normally have, as I have here, right? So there's this dude standing here, typing away at his keyboard, actually with no keyboard at this point because worked that way until the late 1960s, I'm sure Reese is talking about the demonstration of the future and all crap, right, about um, how the web interface was created. So in the early 60s, we had a slightly different interface, but this had a visual display. But instead of the visual display being a screen, which projected outwards to a great number of people, you enclose the screen. So you create a sense of sensory deprivation in the user. That person who sat inside the sensor armor can't look around, they can't look at anything else, they can't hear anything else, sound is blocked off. So you create what we call a sense of sensory deprivation. You focus attention in a particular direction to create a more immersive experience of using a computer. And if you want a very simple idea of how virtual reality works and what it does, it's that. This is a more intimate and more immersive way of engaging with a computer interface. Instead of using your hands, either in a touch interface or in a keyboard interface, you're using your eyes and your ears because it's in your face. That's it. The base level of virtual reality does is transform the way we actually engage with computers. From got a tactile way of interacting with computers to a sort of a perceptory way of interacting with computers, where the computer vision becomes everything that we see. So this is one of the earliest examples of immersive, multi-century, or what we now call multimodal technology, and a virtual reality system. You would get somebody to sit in this, you would put them in the optimum position, and then you would display, and this example, media and computation and data to them in an 
immersive environment and test whether they enjoy this. People didn't enjoy this. This is terrible. This was a really bad idea, but it was a really bad idea because computers at the time weren't particularly that useful and they certainly weren't objects of entertainment that way. This is a bit more like the virtual reality headsets that we have today. This is the first system that used what we call a HMD, a head mounted display. And virtual reality systems these days we call them HMD technology displays. Displays literally mounted on your head, it's kind of self-explanatory, right? This is the Sword of Damocles. Now, what you can see in this picture on the left side, you see all this rigging at the top? Yeah? Yeah. That's there for a reason. This thing was heavy. Like seriously industrially heavy. So they needed a small type of crane to lower it onto someone's head. It couldn't sit on our heads like a machine does today. It was far too heavy for that. Indeed, in one demonstration of this, the chains broke and broke the guy's neck and back who was wearing it at that point in time. <laughs> Dangerous media. The weight of it literally snapped his neck forward, and by going through that, he actually broke two thirds of his back. Heavy metal, people. Yeah. <laughs> so it's called the ultimate display. Um, now, this was probably the first. So this is um, Ivan Sutherland, who was a close associate of uh, JCL Lip Glider. Did we just talk about Lip Glider in a lecture? Um, but not cybernetics, but not JCL lit by the okay. But that's that's fine. He's, he is a, he's an important figure in cybernetics, but he's not like the only guy, you know. Lick Leiden was one of the fathers of cybernetics in the 1940s and 50s. Sutherland worked closely with JCR Lick Leiden and took his ideas on human computer interfaces, if you like, to the natural conclusion. Lick Leiden's idea is that humans and computers would create what we call symbiotic feedback. So we would use computers, they would produce data, and we would receive that data in a continuous loop with one another, much like us with these devices today. And we're always doing this stuff, right? We're finding out about the world. We're always interacting with them, we're always interacting with stuff, and they're interacting back at us, and that creates the sort of feedback loop about how we understand the world. Little I don't think I came up with that notion of the loop. What Sutherland was doing was basically furthering his ideas, was saying, right, well, how are computers going to fulfill this role? And he guessed it was through this kind of system. We're actually going to wear computers. We wear computers as a type of eyewear. So we're going to see the entire world through the lens of the computer itself. And this is his system to try and test that idea. The Sword of Damocles. They call it the Sword of Damocles, just a journal, I don't know if you know the story from antiquity, but the Sword of Damocles. Damocles was a character who had a sword dangling over his head, and if the, sword, if the rope broke, Damocles would get killed by the sword. If that chain broke, you'd get killed by that chain. They called it that literally. Right? So it was a literal thing. 1968, the first demonstration of this machinery. So again, the idea that virtual reality is something which has come along over the last few years, completely wrong. This was, you know, this was old shit when I was born. And I was born a long time ago. It was a long time before I was born. So, what is virtual reality then? There have been many, many, many definitions of virtual reality. Jaron Lanier is a very important person in the history of virtual reality. In the 1980s, he formed a company called VPL, who developed the first commercial virtual reality systems. Unfortunately, the technology at the time meant that these were extremely expensive. A system which would work equivalent today to a 200 pound Oculus Quest or Meta Quest as they're called now. Back in the 80s it would cost over a million pounds. Kind of worked, but you might have a big bank balance to do this sort of thing. Interestingly, he called his uh, device the iPhone. Kind of which Apple then nicked off him, um, Lanier wrote a book, The Dawn of the New Everything, in 2017, where he gave 52 different definitions of virtual reality within that book. 
So there are a lot of ways that we can understand what virtual reality is. If that's the guy who was important in bringing it to the market, and he's got 52 versions of it, how are we supposed to do it? Well, we can drill down a little bit to what Lanny has said. I'm not going to give you all 52, because that would take up the entire freaking two hours, and I'd do nothing else. Lanier talks about certain things over and over again. He talks about cognition, perception, dreaming, existentialism, and phenomenology in these things. So let's go through these one by one. Cognition, how we think. Virtual reality is a technology which affects how we think about things. Perception is a technology that affects how we see the world itself. Dreaming is a way of realizing particular dreams and also simulating what it is to be in a dreamlike state. I mean, very closely focused attention. Existentialism, a bit more philosophical this, but existentialism basically means the lived in experience of the everyday world. So virtual reality is something that can change that and alter it. And phenomenology basically means our everyday consciousness, how we are conscious in the world. Lania virtual reality has distinct effects on how we are conscious beings. We can have better, more quotable examples of definitions here. So, for Ben Woolley, VR has been defined as a more intimate interface between humans and computer imagery, just as I said earlier, right? Closing the intimacy gap between the human and the computer. A system that gives a user an experience of being immersed in a synthesized environment. Synthesized Immersion in virtual worlds and interaction with objects that inform those worlds, giving them the feeling that the person is a real participant in the virtual world. It's kind of important. When VR works, you feel like you're in that space. You feel like it, you, know, you are an actual thing in the same space as other things. When it doesn't work very well, you don't feel like that. And those VR experiences usually aren't very good. You feel like an observer of things. But if it works well, then we feel part of that world. And Nicholas Nicoponte describes it as being there with there being a computer generated simulation. So we feel like we are a, human, you know, a being that's in a computer generated simulation. That's, that's the simplest, kind of the nicest, and it works. All of those definitions, they're all, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds. I've only picked a few out here, right? What I would draw your attention to is that they all use particular verbs to describe virtual reality. This is important for two reasons. The verb is a doing word, right? The verb describes an action of some kind. So virtual reality is an activity. It's not something that we sit and watch. It is something that we perform do. So virtual reality isn't like other media, like cinema, television, where you are an audience, and you're passive in that relationship. Instead, virtual reality is an active thing. You are always doing something when you're in virtual reality. And if we look at those verbs, we are immersed in, we are interacting, we are feeling, we are being, we are perceiving, we are participating. They're all active in the sense of these are human reactions which are being interpreted in the virtual world and, we respond, and being responded to by that virtual world. Any definition of VR therefore includes some kind of activity. It is not passive. It is active and the user is absolutely key to this. With and the user of virtual reality, there is no virtual reality. It doesn't work like that. You can create the virtual reality world but you haven't got a user in it, it's just the computer simulation of something. It's no different to a map in a video game. You have to have somebody in the middle of that responding to what's going around and being an active participant in it in order for it to be a virtual reality world. So this does make virtual reality very different to any other type of media because we are situated in it and it's completely dependent on us. It can't work in any other way. So, VR system consists of a series of inputs from the user that are rendered by the hardware of the system in order to produce an output that is experienced by the user as a virtual experience. 
That's quite a lot in a sentence. That's a really long sentence. If a student wrote that sentence in an essay for me, I put a big fucking line through it and say, use punctuation. Because I don't understand what you're saying anymore. So let's break that down. Okay. What do we have? We have a person over here, right? They have a headset on. And they do certain things. Inputs. <coughs> In the virtual world in which they're in, those inputs are recognized and transformed into outputs. So what they do with the system is interpreted by the system, and they are shown in that virtual environment. So there is a feeling that my activity is being rendered in the virtual environment. That then becomes an output that I perceive directly as a user. Perceive that idea of the feedback loop. I do things, the virtual world renders them in the virtual space. I perceive that, I understand it is me that is doing something here. And because of that, I'm quite happy to accept it. Sure. Yeah, I'm in here. It's me. I'm doing this stuff. Good, excellent, sweet. Let's do some more stuff. This is how basically a virtual experience works. The inputs of the user are a constituent part of that VR environment. Again, if we don't make any inputs, there is no environment. It doesn't exist. I love that episode of The Simpsons. They go to like a country fair or something, and the kids won't do any garden work, and then they go on the virtual reality gardening simulator, and I think, yeah, that's how, that's how things are going to be. Now, a lot of people get virtual reality confused with other types of what we call mixed reality technology. There are a number out there, but the two main ones that we think about are augmented reality and virtual reality. Has anyone tried augmented reality? In what context? Snapchat. Um, I don't know what it was. Snapchat. Snapchat. Yeah. Anyone use Snapchat? Yeah. Yeah? You know you can have Snapchat glasses? Did you have a go with them or did you just see them? I go with them. So okay. It was like you could take pictures of it and then I know that they have some set coming up now with the computers on the screen. Yeah, they so do. Um, I mean, this is commercial augmented yeah. reality. Yeah. One thing you can do with the Snapchat glasses is with the lenses on them, you can run filters. So I'm looking at you right now, which you're being filtered with the Snapchat on. So when I look around the room, it's applying Snapchat filters to those people around me. And then you can snap on them and upload that to Snapchat and so on. Um, Meta have just brought out a pair of these in um, association with Rayman, where you can use, I mean, I don't think they're really augmented reality glasses. The main thing is you can use them to stream and take photos directly to Instagram. On them. The creepy thing about that is that the person that you are doing that with doesn't necessarily know you're doing it. <laughs> I, was about to say. I was about to say. Yeah. Um, be thankful for the Instagram filters, that's all I can say for that. Um, there have been other various tests. The big attempt to do something with this was about 10 years ago, with Google brought out a technology called Google Glass. Uh, Google Glass didn't work very well. Mostly because, if you imagine a pair of glasses, right, like this, they had a tiny digital overlay in the lens, which was a bit too small for anyone to actually use properly. But what was much worse than that is the battery ran around one of the arms. So you put the glasses on, switch them on, and the battery is draining out, right? Then you're tell me what happens to a battery when it's draining out. It gets hot. Thank you. It gets hot. So after about half an hour, you're burning your face off with these things on because it was way, way too hot. So augmented reality technology, the idea that you can overlay everyday sight with digital information, has a big problem still in the design phase yet. We can't quite minimize the technology to an extent that you don't need to have a massive battery pack on the side of the unit. I think this will be overcome in the next couple of years, and they will become more popular, probably in a five-year time scale. A mixed reality headset, right? Um, and the Quest 3 
works on the same principle as well. I've got a class to be in the office. I've, been, I've done this a couple of times to freak people out. I just literally walked around the entire building where because the walkthrough is so good now and it renders in real time so well. But actually, previously in the class two, you would get really the ill. There's a third class of headset called mixed reality headset, where you can do both virtual reality and augmented reality in it. Apple, the Vision Pro apparently can do this. I wouldn't know because I can't afford to buy one, because uh, they're three and a half thousand quid each. Um, so I don't know about that. But I do have a Meta Quest 3, which has this facility. Basically, I put the VR headset on, switch it to pass through mode. It makes through, uh, I think, 16 cameras on the front. I think that's the number, it might be more, makes a digital representation of the space in front of me in real time. So I'm not seeing the world like I'm seeing it now, but I'm seeing the headset render the world as it is, so it looks just about exactly the same. And in that, I can then have virtual objects alongside real stuff on people. So I, the idea being that we can have, say, the two of us are wearing the Quest 3 headset, we can sit here and talk about this and we can pull down I don't know, a map of the city in front of us and start doing like a bit of urban planning, you know, saying right, we're gonna put a building here, we're gonna put a building there, and anyone who's watching us, what the fuck are they finding that? Because they're not in the virtual experience with us, right? But, but you know, we've got a shared virtual experience in actual space. Thank you for raising that because that's another one. So if you want to learn more about Pokemon Go, please go and purchase the third one of my books, which I'm not going to play right now. That would be an augmented reality uh, game. Now that's probably the most common example of augmented reality that people have experienced. 2016, Niantic Labs, which is an offshoot of Google, released a game for smartphones called Pokemon Go. Has anyone had a go at this? Played it? Did you know what I mean by it? Pokemon Go, really, really straightforward. You hold your phone up like so. So you're basically looking at the world beyond but through the lens of your phone. On your phone display, you will have superimposed cute little characters from the Pokemon series, which you then flick objects at on the surface of your phone. They get captured, you get points, etc., etc. It became a big craze in 2016. People did really, really fascinating things with it. Like they would be going like this, trying to catch Pokemon, and then they walk off a cliff. <laughs> that happened four or five times to people. Uh, one couple of people in America uh, got shot. Do you know how Americans are, right? <laughs> you know, you, you're walking along, you're trying to get your Pokemon here, you know. Walk onto somebody's yard, there's a sign on the yard that says, Do not trespass. If you trespass, it do not come somebody with a gun and close the fuck out of you. That happened twice. There are two Pokemon Go murders because of this, uh, which are very famous. Um, you know, weird things in Britain, like um, somebody walked into a funeral. So in a church, right, there's a funeral service going on. This person had headphones in, and they literally they walked in, and this made the newspapers like this. Flipping away, <laughs> there's a fucking, there's corpse, you know, there's this casket, there's everything going on. There's a whole service going on at this point in time. Loads of people fell into the rivers and so on. A lot of injuries from walking into stuff because you're not really paying attention to what you're moving towards instead of paying attention to the display on the screen. This is called an augmented reality display. Augmented because it superimposes digital objects into the real world. So they can augment the real world with the digital. It's a very different concept of virtual reality. Augmented means you take digital objects and put them in the real world. Virtual reality means you create a different environment. So they shouldn't be confused with one another. What we try to do as theoretical um, researchers in this area is we argue that this is a continuum. So over here, we have the real world. 
where we are right now, yeah? In the middle, we have augmented reality. We're adding digital objects to the real world. Over here, we have virtual reality. We're far away from the real. It's all digital objects at that point. So as you move along the continuum, you're adding more and more digital to that continuum, okay? So it's a sliding scale. They're related to each other, I guess. But the experience of augmented reality is very different from the experience of virtual reality. Now, historically, virtual reality is really interesting. I'm a lot older than you guys in this room, right? I'm uh, 44. God, that's so depressing. I didn't used to be 44, I used to be young. Now I'm old. Um, that means, like, in the early 1990s, I was, I was just about becoming a teenager. And I remember being like 13 and being told by the mid 1990s, which when you're 13 sounds a long way away in the mid 1990s. You know when you're like it's 1993 and somebody says 1996, you think, damn, that's, that's like a million years from now. Like, oh, I'm, I'm, this is going to be a huge thing. I remember reading a lot of articles in 1993 telling me that by 1996, Everyone would be using virtual reality. It would be the biggest thing. We, like, I was a big video game player when I was a kid, still am now. That's why I teach video games and write books about them and research them, right? But when I was a kid, I used to play like Sega and all this sort of stuff and reading magazines about video games. And they were telling me, you're not going to be doing that childish stuff with your hands. You're going to have the whole thing on your you're, gonna, you're not going to be controlling Sonic the Hedgehog in a few years' time. You're going to be Sonic the Hedgehog for you. Like, man, this is going to be the shit, right? This is going to be it. This is going to be jacked. I am going to be all over this stuff. You know how. Right? Just in that, it's like mid-90s, what did we have? Did we have all this good stuff? We did not have this good stuff. We had the same boring ass shit that we had before. Terrible. They lied to me. The media lied to me. <laughs> I was so naive when I was a kid, but I got there in the end, okay? So, what you had in the 1990s was a real period of enthusiasm for virtual reality. Everyone thought this thing was going to take off and it was become the thing. It was going to be the huge thing. And what they got wrong, actually, was what was going to become big. We all thought, okay, interfaces are going to be the next big thing. Thing. We're going to change the interfaces we have from the WIMP interface to a more intimate virtual interface. Actually, what nobody saw coming that they should have was the big thing for computing was going to be the internet. It wasn't going to be virtual reality. 1995 comes along, Windows release, Windows 95, and the internet takes off in a huge way. And everyone gets obsessed with online space, not virtual space, which is a different thing altogether, right? Everyone gets obsessed about the internet creating spaces for interaction, not with us creating virtual worlds. And that drew a huge amount of the attention away from virtual reality. So the early point of the 1990s in particular, you had this big movement, what we call a discourse about virtual reality. Virtual reality was going to be the whole thing. In the new millennium, we were all going to be in virtual reality. We're just going to leave physical world behind. Because the physical world sucked in the 1990s, and in the 80s, and all the time before that as well. War, famine, pestilence, death. No, I don't want any of that stuff. I want, you know, sweet stuff. Virtual reality was going to bring us that. But instead, we all went on chat rooms and AOL and started abusing one another, and here we are in, uh, doing the same thing in 2023, right? Um, we have, there was a huge amount of enthusiasm, what we call a techno-utopian expectation for what virtual reality could do. The hype was that virtual reality would deliver a new mode of experience for human beings. You know, the digital revolution, as this module is called, well, in the early 90s, the digital revolution was literally going to be, we are not going to need this stuff anymore. Instead, we're going to do everything in virtual worlds, and it is all going to be sweet, and it is all going to be nice, and we're going to get rid of war, and we're going to get rid of conflict, and we're going to get rid of people 
you know, play Pokemon Go and get shot in someone's lawn. No, 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 we're doing Pokemon Go in virtual reality. Nobody's going to get shot, right? It didn't happen. Good question. Is yes. this part of, you say it's going to be mainstream soon? Like, are we, are we still kind of on the edge? Where we oh, we're still waiting. waiting. <laughs> yeah, we're still waiting, yeah. So I feel like it's been like that for like a little bit now. About eight years now, I would say. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I mean, I'll come to it later because you preempted me a bit, but you are right. Virtual reality is here now in a way that it wasn't ever at that time. Um, but it's still not like really up. Up. There are some people that are interested in that really like mainstream across. Yeah, I mean, there's a few things holding it back at the moment, but I think the main one, I mean, I'll come to this later as well, so I'm kind of going to be referring to something as well, but the main one at the moment is false. Nobody wants to wear that shirt. It's falls your head. <laughs> you know, it's uncomfortable. You know, I mean, you've got, you know, the MSC VR, right? So you, you use the headsets a lot. Yeah. Um, they're still not something which you want to wear like five, six hours in the Just three, let's do the I mean, you get, I mean, it gets better with every iteration. I think mean, it genuinely does improve. If you go back to using Riff now, which I mean, it's a different world. They, they, they feel like they're driving your face now. Um, but they get it. And the problem is, we are that we are going to use it to do the. I'm interested to see if Apple is following my shelf if we're going to give it a try. And maybe Apple coming into the market will change people's perception of it. We'll come back to this. I think it's your point really well made. Um, the dot com bust of the 2000s basically put a pay to anything to do with virtual reality as well. Nobody wanted to invest in this kind of technology after the 90s. Why? Too expensive, not enough return on investment. That was basically what was found. The technology of the 80s basically wasn't ever going to be mature enough. You had a vision. We're going to make an entire, not, not going to just make our world, we're going to make lots of different worlds, and whichever one you want to be in, you can be in, right? We're going to give you choice of where you exist. So this incredible vision of what the technology could do, but the actual state of technology in the 80s and 90s, this was impossible. In order to run a fully realized virtual world in the 1980s, you would have needed all the computing power of NASA, and then times it by 10. You know, it just couldn't be done. The visuals, can you imagine how crappy the visuals were? This is not going to be a convincing virtual world. You just didn't have the power to render graphics in a way which would make this acceptable. But we're not in the 80s anymore. We're in the 2010s and now 2020s. As technology has improved, that gap between the vision of virtual reality and what can be done by the technology is closed. Okay. Hence, the title of my book from 2018 is called The Reemergence of Virtual Reality because it literally reemerges in the 2010s when technology is caught up with the vision. For years, starting in the 1980s, you had a vision of what virtual reality could do. Now, you have the technology can actually do this. The promise of VR, as I told you, I would tell you what it is. The promise of VR is the potential of a kind of what we call worldhood or feeling of world that can be made in a medium that's totally immersive. The idea that we can put people in a virtual environment and they will feel at home. Worldhood means effectively that we appreciate the environment around us as being somewhere where we want to be, at home in. Lots of media is immersive. You can read a book and be immersive. You read a good novel, yeah, that's immersive, right? You know, you turn the pages, you into the story, that's great. Television programs can be immersive. Films can be immersive. You can sit in the cinema and watch a film and you can be really into that film for that period. This is a different level of the version of the game.
complete sensory disavowal. This is all you're going to see. The promise of virtual reality is to create a medium that immerses totally in the physical world. Let's take a break for five minutes. Tired. <laughs> we'll start again. Three o'clock. I'm tired as well, I was teaching this morning.